Good morning. Welcome to DEC. If you're new here, we're so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We're going to start our service by standing together and by lifting up our voices to the King.
Good morning. So Easter's coming. We're excited about that. This is one of those bizarre uh, seasons, however, when we're excited to see as many people come as possible, but we're also trying to remain cautious about uh, distancing and making sure that we are respecting all the normal boundaries that are still in place. Um, so that being said, um, we're really excited to, to see hopefully a lot of new faces uh, this coming Easter um, and to be able to kind of welcome some folks who wouldn't otherwise uh, be joining us here for worship on Easter Sunday. Um, but to make sure, once again, that we kind of follow the normal protocols on joining and gathering um, this time of year that we are arranging accordingly here. Uh, that being said, we've established a, a ticket um, or a way that you can sign up for um, which service you're going to be attending. Um, so for those whose email addresses we have, we've sent out an email that you can sign up online to indicate which service on Easter Sunday that you're planning to join us for. Um, there's going to be four services on Easter Sunday. Um, so those are 7 o'clock. There's going to be an early morning, shorter, uh, traditional service. It's going to be right here, um, not at Jackson's Landing, for those that are used to the uh, historical sunrise service. All four services are going to be here, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock. Uh, once again, we're really excited for that. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet to sign up for one of those services, um, you can do so online or uh, Amy's actually right out front and she can help you get signed up for one of those services today. So um, really excited for that. Um, looking forward to uh, what's going to happen. There's more details about um, both the Good Friday service that week and uh, the Easter service in your bulletins. Um, a couple other announcements as well. Um, college game night is going to be this coming Sunday, the 21st. I believe that is. Uh, also, some information in your bulletin about that. That's just a time to kind of invite folks that are college age to come in and hang out. We'll have some snacks and um, and just get to know each other. Uh, that's 7 o'clock uh, next Sunday night. Um, so if you want to swing by for that and get to know some college kids, you are more than welcome. And then this Thursday afternoon at 4.30 um, here at the church, there's also going to be a memorial service for Marnie Sumner. Um, for those that that new Marnie, she was uh, just an incredible blessing to this church um, for many, many years. Um, she was just a great impact on this community, um, and she went home to be with the Lord just a few weeks ago. Um, so 4.30 uh, this coming Thursday afternoon, um, be a short service followed by a time of refreshment. So um, let's spend some time in prayer this morning together. Father God, this morning we're reminded that, that as a community, Father, we uh, come in here with just very different pictures, God, of, um, Father, of what the future might look like for us individually. We come in with busy minds and hearts, God, uh, very, uh, in many ways, con concerned about, Lord, what the future might hold We have a, a world that's filled with um, just things that are competing for our affections, God. And Father, as the world continues to call on us to put trust in ourselves and what it is that we're able to do as we try to ready ourselves for just an uncertain future uh, in an ever-changing world, God, we are reminded of your concrete, steady, unchanging nature, God and we take rest in that this morning. Father, we are incredibly encouraged as we open up your word and we see time and time again how you are a God that is faithful. Father, you have, over the seasons in just this church's life, God, you have shown yourself faithful. God, and we, we worship you this morning because of what it is that you've done for us on an eternal scale, God. Father, there is nothing that can happen to us in this life that can rob us from the joy that comes from knowing that we have the right to be called your children, Father. And we worship you in that spirit this morning. As we continue to, to drink of your word this morning, God, as we hear about who we are in Christ, as Dan brings us a message from your word, Father, let us, God, let us be changed. Let us actually walk away different people, our hearts and our minds molded and shaped according to your word, what your word says about who we are in Christ. Father, let us be a different people because of the truth, God, that you put in our hearts. We love you, Father. 
be magnified in this place this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship this morning?
Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are the one that we can put our hope and our trust in. Father, that your nature is never changing. Lord, you are a good God who takes care of us, who is faithful. Lord, may we put our hope and our trust in you and in nothing else. Lord, we pray all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Well, this, uh, this service should be a little better. The, the 8 o'clock service, after everyone lost an hour of sleep last night, we were dragging just a little bit, but uh, hopefully you guys are all wide awake at this point. Um, before we get into the Word, and we're going to be in the book of Ephesians this morning, so we're not going far from Colossians, but we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Uh, but before we jump in, I just want to I want to remind people, I've had the opportunity over the last uh, three or four weeks to meet a lot of people who uh, are new to DEC, uh, who have just started coming to DEC or just visiting, kind of checking out uh, what we're doing here and what's going on here. And I want to encourage you, uh, when this service is over, and again, I know COVID makes things weird, I get it, but don't miss an opportunity to connect. Uh, if you see someone that you don't know, if you see someone you haven't met before, go introduce yourself and, uh, and talk a little bit. Because over these last few weeks, I've also seen some of these uh, families and individuals just kind of get up and walk out with no interaction from, uh, from anyone here at DEC. And look, I know you're wonderful people. I want other people to know that you're wonderful people. Uh, so again, don't, don't miss an opportunity today to, uh, to connect with someone. Um, don't just take off, and don't just look for uh, the people that you talk to every week. Uh, try to connect with somebody new this morning. My four kids have all accomplished something by the age of two years old that I would guess not a lot of kids can claim. And it doesn't, I know everyone thinks their kids are special. I get it, all right? But my kids, by the time they were two years old, each one of my children had knocked me completely unconscious. All four of them. And with the exception of Catherine, who learned from her mistakes, all of them have knocked me out multiple times. William joined the club, uh, the multiple knockout club, just about a month, month and a half ago. And uh, my kids know, my big kids think it's funny um, because they think any time I get hurt is funny. But I just know that I was playing with William and we were wrestling a little bit, and I scooped him up kind of in a, I don't know what they call it. A, I mean, I was kind of holding him like he was a little baby again. And he's eight. You know, he's not that little. He's a, he's a tall kid now at this point. And, and the next thing I know, I was waking up on the ground with no idea what had just gone on. And all of my family is there. All four kids and my wife just looking at me and laughing. Now, apparently, what, we still don't quite know what had happened, but apparently, when I was semi-conscious, uh, Aaron said I was out for about five minutes or so, and, and, and as I was coming to, I began to talk, and it, apparently, I'm very demanding when I don't know what I'm saying. And um, I had demanded that she call the older kids so that we could all be together just in case. I, I don't know, um, but apparently, I get pretty needy and dramatic as well when I'm uh, not aware of what it is that I'm saying. And, and so I woke up, and again, my, my big kids are just laughing at me, and they had taken a whole bunch of pictures. Um, uh, apparently, my hand was cramping. I don't know how these are connected, but my wife actually put like a small gourd in my, <laughs> my hand to keep it. So they've got all these pictures of me just clutching this little gourd um, in a semi-conscious state. But there's a few things that my wife knows that she has to ask when something like this happens. Uh, I've shared with you before, I have a long history of concussions. I got my very first one when my wife and I were engaged. So Erin has been with me for all of these. And she knows the drill, which there, there's not a lot to it at this point, other than, I guess, trying to make me comfortable and, and just letting me ride it out a little bit. But she has a series of questions that she asks. Do you know where you are? Yes, I'm on the couch. Do you know what happened? 
No, no clue. I, I didn't. I guessed it was something to do with William because that was the last memory I had. Uh, and William was not, like he had run away as soon as I woke up. So I figured it was something uh, with him. And then the important one. Do you know who you are? And I always, I don't know if you guys remember the old, I think it was a Snickers commercial where the guy got knocked out and they asked him and he, I am Batman. And I always, I did that once with Aaron and she didn't think it was funny at all. So she asked though, do you know who you are? Yes, I'm, I'm Dan Richter, I'm your husband. Because when someone has suffered head trauma, that's an important thing. If you know who you are still, that's a good sign. I think as Christians, that's the question we need to be asking ourselves as well. Do you know who you are? Because just like it's important when you've suffered a head trauma, it's important as a Christian to be able to answer that question because we live in a world that has always wanted to define us. Always. Throughout history. And we live in a time today especially where the world wants to tell us that our identity is based in our race or our identity is based in our gender or in our sexuality or in our uh, our political affiliation and all of those different things and i believe that this is something that christians and the church need to push back on with everything that we have because as christians our identity is based on the unchanging nature of jesus christ and christ alone it's not in the things that we own it's not in the job that we have it's not in even the family that we have and the people that we surround ourselves with our identity is fixed our identity is unchanging and as we begin this new series we're going to be looking at all of the things that scripture says you are so that when someone asks you that question do you know who you are you'll be able to stand and say this is who i am this is where my identity is based and again these are unchanging things fixed in jesus christ and we're going to be looking at at the book of ephesians because throughout ephesians as paul writes this letter you have this phrase over and over and over in christ in christ saying look once you put your faith in christ once you become a child of god and begin to live in the freedom that comes with this this is now who you are this is what your identity is these are the things that you can claim to be not because of who you are but because of who jesus is and so this morning we're going to start in ephesians chapter 2 and we're going to read the first 10 verses and this is kind of the just the the launch point the jumping off point laying a little bit of foundation before we begin to get into some of the specific parts of our identity that scripture tells us are a part of who we are ephesians chapter 2 And Paul starts out as he normally does with with giving you the contrast. This is who you were. He says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. And then he gives you the rest of the story. Then he gives you what it is that the Spirit produces in you. What it is that changes the moment that you place your faith in Jesus Christ. The moment that you enter into a relationship with God through Jesus. In verse 4, he says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he's done for us who are united with Christ. You've already seen it several times here. In Christ, with Christ. It's all about what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. In verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Paul says here, look, you died, but you were raised back to life through the work of Jesus Christ, and now you are new. You've been given a new identity. You are a new person. You've been given something that will not change. And no matter what the world around us tries to tell us our identity is, the truth is that we stand on our identity in Jesus. 
And what we're going to look at in these next, I almost said few weeks, but these next couple years, we're going to look at these specifics. And I don't think there's going to be anything that we talk about that people go, oh, I've never heard that before. Oh, I wasn't aware of that at all. Most of this that we look at, they're going to be things that you've heard and you've probably heard many messages about. But it's time that we move from hearing it, and for some even kind of, we get it, we understand it, moving from that to believing it and living in it and living in the freedom that comes from it. Because I talk to all people all the time that say, yeah, I, I understand God loves me, but... Well, I understand that I'm forgiven, but I understand that I'm, I'm God's child, but, and we've got all these different excuses for why we don't actually embrace this identity that we've been given through faith in Jesus Christ. And there's a couple of books that I, that I looked at, that I read as I prepared for this series. The first is called, Who Do You Think You Are? by Mark Driscoll. And, and I did have someone ask a question after the first service. Mark Driscoll had some issues at the church that he planted out in Seattle. Um, my understanding is he was not nice to people. He was a little bit of a bully, a little bit of a jerk. Um, the book is truth. <laughs> it's written by a very flawed man, and I will fully acknowledge that. But my argument to that is always going to be, well, we preach from David in Scripture, and David was a very flawed man. Scripture lays that right out for us. And so, again, take it for what it's worth. If you want nothing to do with, with Mark Driscoll, don't read the book, and you don't have to listen to anything else that I say. Um, but that's the first. Who Do You Think You Are by Mike, Mark Driscoll. The other is Alter Ego by Craig Rochelle. And um, if you want a little bit more depth to what we're looking at, if you want to go a little bit deeper, these are great books uh, to take a look at. These are great books to read. And, and I'm going to pull some different things from them over the course of this series. Um, i a lot of it is just kind of the, the outline-ish, the, the bones of some of these messages. A lot of what we're looking at today, as far as the outline goes, uh, is from the first chapter of, of Driscoll's book. Driscoll starts with this idea that all of us are worshipers. All of us worship something. And he, he, he identifies some things that have become idols of our hearts. Now, some people think, well, idolatry is not an issue anymore. You know, that's the, that's the Old Testament stuff where they actually had idols. They had carven images or things that they would actually bow down to and they would, they would worship and they would, they would think had some sway. On their, we don't do that anymore. And the reality is, absolutely we do. All of us worship different things in our lives. And for many of us, we have things in our lives that we've elevated to the status of worshiping. We've elevated to the status that only God ought to occupy in our lives. And those things become idols in our lives. The question is not, are you a worshiper? The question is, what are we worshiping? And Driscoll says all of creation can be divided into two categories. Those who worship the creator and those who worship created things. Because of sin, we're prone to worship anyone and anything other than the God who made everyone and everything. And that's idolatry. And what I want to dig into this morning as we, again, lay the foundation for the rest of this series is how those two ideas intersect. What does idolatry have to do with our identity? And I think we tend to... Uh, convince ourselves that those things that we worship, those things that we elevate to that, that God status in our lives, dictate our identity. Those things that are most important to us tend, in our minds, we tend to believe those are the things that make us who we are. Those become the important things for us. And so often for Christians, when we talk about identity and we find that our sense of identity, our source of identity is off, it comes back to the fact that who you are and who you think you are is rooted in your idolatry. I want to look at four lies that we fall for when it comes to defining ourselves. When we think about who it is that we are, because if I asked you that question, who are you? My guess is most of you would go to one of these things. You'd start to talk about, well, I'm this, because you'd start to talk about the things that you own or, or the job that you do. Or the fact that you are a parent of these children, or the husband or wife of, of this spouse. 
When the reality is that none of those things define who we are. And each of those things, when they're elevated to the status of worship in our lives, can become an identity thief. And so I want to look at four of those this morning. The first, and one of the biggest ones that, that I think we see in America, especially today, is possessions. Possessions. This is where you find your sense of self-worth. You find your, your sense of who you are in the things that you own. The labels on your clothes, or the square footage of your home, or the type of car that you drive. And America fuels this. In America, we have made consumerism a religion. That whole idea of, I've got to keep up, I've got to keep up, I've got to keep up with the Joneses. We've made that an art. And we're pushed and we're encouraged to build our lives around these things. And we see it all the time. We have families that are drowning in debt because they've placed their identity, their sense of self-worth in the things that they possess. And material things are no longer valued for their usefulness. But they play a central role in, in cultivating and maintaining the identity that we've set up. Now, understand this, everything that we look at here, each of these four things, in and of themselves, they're not bad. Possessions, in and of themselves, are not bad. This is not going to be a message that ends with, you know, let's go move to Montana and live in a commune together, all right? Possessions aren't bad in and of themselves. It's always the, the motive behind them. It's always the heart behind them. And again, that's true for each and every one of these things. But possessions can become an identity thief when we're placing our sense of self-worth on the things that we own. The second identity thief that I want to look at is responsibilities. Now, this one is a very broad category. Responsibilities can be jobs, it can be hobbies, it can, be, it can even be parenting. It's those things that we do. We're, we're placing our sense of self-worth, we're defining who it is that we are by the things that we do or the things that that we accomplish and all of us have responsibilities starting when we're little kids with the chores that we're given and those responsibilities grow as we're older and so often we find things that we're good at and we find things that that we like and again there's nothing wrong with that and God did create us in a certain way to accomplish certain things but we begin to think that if I do those things that makes me who I am or or I am important or I ought to be loved because I've accomplished this. And we sacrifice on the altar of success and achievement. Years ago, when Michael Jordan turned 50, Sports Illustrated did a great article on him. And the gist of the entire article was, here's this, this man who I still, I think the people that say he's not the greatest basketball player ever just never watched him play. He's, I think he's the greatest that's ever played. But this man, when he stopped playing basketball, was lost. And the whole article was about how he spent time since he retired basically trying to figure out who he is, trying to figure out what his identity is now. And they did a documentary, I think, just last year that kind of painted that exact same picture. And it's sad because apart from what he could do and apart from what he accomplished on the basketball court, this was a man that didn't know who he was. I struggled with this a few years ago. When I resigned from my church in New York, I didn't have a ministry position to go to at that point. And it was five months before we ended up in Foxborough. And at that point in my life, for 11 years, I had been Pastor Dan. That was who I was. That was, that was a huge part of my identity. That was a big part of, of where I was getting my sense of self-worth and how I was a pastor and how I interacted with people and how I could help people. And I had that taken away. For five months, I wasn't in vocational ministry, and I was just Dan. And I'll tell you, those first couple months, my wife didn't like just Dan. Because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to act when I had that seemingly what I felt like taken away from me. And God had to walk both of us, my wife and I, through some very hard lessons in those days to realign my sense of, identity because the reality is i have responsibilities i'm a pastor i love being a pastor i love what i do I, i'm thankful every day that i get to wake up in the morning and do what god has called me to do i'm a husband 
I have responsibilities as a husband. I'm a father. I have responsibilities as a father. But none of those things are who I am. And if you take any of those things away, if God were to take any of those things away, it doesn't change who He says that I am. Responsibilities, the way we do things, they're important. Performing well is important. Just last week we looked at Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. We're to work hard. We're to give our best. But success or failure doesn't define us. Whether it's your job, what you do for vocation, whether you're a, a high school, a college kids, and it's, it's grades, a C doesn't change your identity. As long as you've done what God calls us to and you've worked hard and you've done it with all of your strength. Who we are doesn't change based on the outcome of our success or failure. The third identity thief is other people. This one's fairly straightforward. But this is a trap that a lot of us fall into as well. Basing our identity on whether other people like us or not. Basing our identity on whether other people are validating us or not. Our sense of self-worth comes with the people around us. And that's giving them a, a power and an authority in our lives, again, that ought to belong only to God. And I think you see two extremes of this. You, you see the idol of independence, and you see the idol of dependence. The idol of independence says, I don't need people. I can do this. It's like the, the two-year-old that when you're trying to put their shoe on, you don't know I do it. You know, you know you're going to be there for 45 minutes now as they try to get the shoe, and they're always going to end up on the wrong feet. I don't understand how that happens. They got a 50-50 shot, and they always get the shoe on, on the wrong foot. But it's that mentality that some adults never grow out of. I don't need people. I don't need help. I'm going to do this by myself. And we draw our sense of worth, and we draw our identity from that. And I think some of it is a response to past pain, past hurts. It's the walls we put up, and we don't want to go back to that place. And then on the flip side of that, it's it's that idea of dependence. And this is one where I think so many people that are wired to be people pleasers, those ones that just hate to say no to anything, this is where they land on this end of things. Because I want people to like me. I want people to to love me. I want people to think that I'm essential, that they can't live their lives without me, and that's where I draw my sense of self-worth. And I think you see it in such an exaggerated way. When I was a youth pastor working with teenagers, you see this in an exaggerated way because they're struggling to figure things out at that age, and they're struggling to figure out where they fit in and what things look like, and they're struggling with that sense of identity. And so it's all about, well, who likes me? Whether it's, you know, opposite sex, you know, who has a crush on me? Who do I have a crush on? Who am I dating? Who am I not dating? Who just broke up with me? Who, but it's all those other things. Do my teachers like me? Do my parents like me? Do my peers like me? I want to be accepted. And with teens, you see them make so many of their mistakes come back to this. They did it because they just long to be loved and accepted. And for them, that's where their identity is. I'm only something if people love me. I'm only something if people validate me. I remember sitting with a young lady who had just broken up with her boyfriend. And I think they'd been dating maybe, I don't know, six months, somewhere in there. And the entire time that I was there with her, she sobbed. I'm talking hours. Sobbed. And I remember at one point, she said, I just don't know who I am without him. She was 14. 14. I mean, on one hand, it's kind of funny. On the other hand, it's, it's kind of sad. To make that statement of 14, I don't know who I am apart from this person. And you could say, look, I'm grown up now. I don't do silly things like that. But yes, we do. We still do. We still put our sense of, of worth and identity in the hands of other people. Think about the power that we give people in our lives. Think about the days where uh, your entire outlook on the day has changed because someone says something nice to you. Someone tells you they, they like your shirt. 
And all of a sudden, the emotions change. Though ah, That's a good day. But then the flip side of that, what happens when someone criticizes? What happens when someone says something, something mean or something rude to us? How many times does our day change for the better or for the worse based on the external things that people see and say? And Driscoll says in his book, in giving this power in our lives to others, we give them a godlike position to rule over us and to define who we are. And that's the very definition of idolatry. And again, relationships aren't bad. In fact, all through Scripture, you see that we're created for relationship. We're created for fellowship. We're created to need other people and to work in harmony with other people, and especially the church, to stand shoulder to shoulder with people on mission and moving towards what it is that God has called us to accomplish as a church and as a ministry. But when we're looking to those relationships to define who we are, when we begin to change things about ourselves just to blend in or just to try to impress other people, that's when it becomes idolatry. That's when we fall in victim to identity theft. And the last one that I want to look at is, is probably the toughest because this seems to be the one, certainly, that is tied to uh, so many uh, emotions and so many things that are seated deep within us, and that's trial. Often we define ourselves by the things that we've gone through, by the trials in our lives. James says uh, that we're to consider it pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds. And I think it's very interesting here. That James could have said, consider it pure joy if you ever happen to have a trial. Consider it pure joy maybe on the off chance that something bad happens during this life. No, he says, when? When? Because in New Testament Bible times, it was going to happen. And today in 2021, it's going to happen. We are going to face trials. We are going to face tough stuff in this life. And as Christians... Some of that's going to come from the fact that we are called to stand counterculture. That we're called to push back on a lot of things that society says need to be at the core of who we are as a, as a nation, who we are as a world. That we're called to think differently, and we're called to believe differently, and we're called to live differently. And that's going to create fix, or friction in our lives. So it's a fact that you will face trials. Jesus himself said it. In this world you will have trouble. Absolutely. And anyone that tells you any differently uh, is lying to you. And this is where the whether it's whether it's relational issues, whether it's health, financial, spiritual, emotional, or a combination of all of those things, we will face trial. And when we suffer, the temptation can be to draw our identity from that. When we suffer, when we go through things, the temptation can be to identify with that. I sat with a young lady uh, who had been a victim of abuse as a very, very young child in a preschool uh, setting. Terrible stuff. And honestly, it's one of those sitting there, it, it just horrific, criminal. And look, you can see how it would impact her life absolutely, unequivocally. You can see how it would impact some of the things that she did and some of the decisions that she made as she grew. Absolutely. But this young lady, as we continue to work together, this young lady had made that her entire identity. Her entire identity was based on what had been done to her. And as we talked about all these different things, as we talked about her identity in Christ and who it was that God said she was, she couldn't get there. And as Christians, our identity is never based on what's been done to us. Our identity is based on what's been done for us, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. And those, those trials that we go through, those terrible things that happen, uh, cancer diagnosis, domestic abuse, uh, the worst things that you can think of, loss of a loved one, those things certainly can explain some of our actions, but they do not define 
who we are and who we're called to be. Our identity is not in what we've suffered. Our identity is in Christ alone. Do not let trials rob you of your identity. When I was in kindergarten, we were sent home with a project. And the project was that we had to share with the class who we were. And we, we were to do it by, I think they called it a, a mobile. It was like a, a hanger and some stuff hanging down off the hanger. And obviously, at five years old, I'm not contributing a whole lot to this project. So I took it home, and my mother did the entire thing. Very much like high school still. By college, Aaron was doing most of the stuff. But I remember the teacher, it was my turn. And the teacher calls me up, and she hangs the mobile on a little hook, and she's looking at it, and she's reading all the different things. And there's pictures of stuff I like to do and all those, those different things. And she says, well, this is Danny. All right. She was allowed to call me Danny because I was five. Nobody here is allowed to call me Danny. Just, I don't know if excommunication's a thing in the Protestant church, but we will bring it back. She said, this is Danny. Danny means, or Daniel means, God is my judge. His middle name is Joel. Joel means the Lord is God. And his last name is Richter, which is German for judge. And I remember standing there, and she looked over at me, and she could tell immediately that something was wrong. And I said, that's not my name. She said, well, honey, you know, your your mom wrote this, and you're Daniel Joel Richter. The problem is I'm not. I'm Daniel John Richter. I've always been Daniel John Richter. It's on my birth certificate. My mom had twin brothers, John and Joel. My brother is Stephen Joel Richter. (laughs) And I remember getting more and more upset as this teacher argued with me about who I was. And I remember finally stomping my little five-year-old foot because who's the teacher going to believe? The mom who's a grown-up and named the kid? Or the kid that may or may not have still been eating glue at that point in his life? And I remember stomping my foot and saying to her, I know who I am. It didn't matter what was written on that card. It didn't matter what even my mom said at that point. It didn't matter what my teacher said at that point. I knew who I was, and no one was going to change that. As Christians, it doesn't matter what people tell you. It doesn't matter who people say that you are. It doesn't matter what this world tries to convince you you are. It doesn't matter what Satan is whispering in your ear to try to convince you that this is who you are. Your name is written in stone. Your identity will not change, no matter what anyone else thinks. And as Christians, we're not our past. We're not our relationships. We're not our job. We're not our mistakes. We're not our kids, we're not our parents, and we're not the sum of what what we own. And we are absolutely not an accident. Listen to what God says. This is who you are. You're God's masterpiece. You're created anew in Christ Jesus. You are the temple of of the living God, and you are justified and redeemed and forgiven and adopted. You are holy and set apart. You are adored. You are free. You are pursued. You're a holy priesthood together with all the saints. You're gifted. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You are crucified with Christ and joint heirs with Jesus of all that God promised. You're chosen. You're blessed, you're blameless, and you're sealed with the Spirit. And you are a new creation, loved, and your identity is now found in Christ alone. And by the end of this series, 
when someone tries to convince you of anything other than that truth. Maybe don't stomp your foot, Adam. But my hope is that you would be able to look at them and say, I don't care what you say. I know who I am. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you that the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ, who we are is forever changed. The moment that we enter into a relationship with you, the moment that you take us uh, from far away to near, our identity will never be altered again. And Lord, I know that there is so much that you want to do over the course of these weeks. I know that each of these that we look at, there's going to be those that are struggling. There's going to be those that it absolutely hits home with. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit would work in a mighty way. I pray that your spirit would begin to minister to the hearts and to the minds of those that need to hear your truth in these coming weeks. Whether they're here in person, whether they're online, whether they're neither and they don't even know that they're going to end up here in the next few weeks. Lord, we are trusting you to do a work. And Lord, we thank you that in the midst of a world that is constantly shifting, a world that's constantly changing, where it can be so hard to, to keep up, that your promises to us are everlasting. That who you say we are in Christ in a relationship with you will not and cannot change. So, Lord, take us from that place of hearing to the point of believing. Take us from understanding it in our heads to having it deep in our hearts. That we would understand the freedom that comes from you and from placing our identity in you alone. you stand with us as we close in song this morning? Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever the only one who could
So this week, we'll be presented with opportunities. We'll wrestle with thoughts, and we will be given a chance to make decisions, some small decisions, some big decisions. Um, but as we are presented with these opportunities and these decisions, let us be reminded of who we are in Christ and to Christ, in whom our identity is found, to him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.